Bionicle Adventures 9 Web of Shadows Written by Greg Farshti Recording by Nimitron Chapter 7 In times past, the Toa's journey from Garmetru to Kometru would have been a quick and simple trip through the transport chutes. Any one of a dozen chutes connected the two metru, most running near the Colosseum. But with so many shoes destroyed, and the Colosseum now in the hands of the Vizorak, Nokama and the others had to take a longer, slower, overland route to Nuju's Metru. Upon reaching the border of Le Metru and Co Metru, they found that the canal once bridged by chutes now played host to a very different kind of span. Vizorak had constructed a bridge of webbing to connect the two Metru. Nokama, Nuju, Wenua, and Nori crossed over immediately, leaving Onowa and Matao behind to guard the rear. The Toa Hodika of Stone now stopped to listen. They had done their best to avoid attracting the attention of Vizorak along the journey, but he was fairly certain a squad of Onorak had spotted them as they neared the border. The strange sounds he heard only confirmed his fear. What was that? he asked Matao. The sounds grew nearer, the scuttling noise produced by a dozen Vizorak closing in on their position. I'll give you one guess. As long as it's Vizorak, Matao answered. Beat feet! Onua started to take a step onto the bridge, then hesitated. You think it'll hold? I don't know, but I'd rather take my chances with it than them. Good point, said Onua. On the other side of the span, Nokama turned back to see her two fellow Toa Hodika still lagging. Matao! Onua! Hurry! she shouted. The Toa Hodika of stone gingerly put his foot on the bridge. Instantly, he knew it had been a mistake. Strained beyond its breaking point, the webbing snapped violently. Onua fell backward as Nokama, Nuju, Wenua, and Norik were launched into the air as if from a slingshot. The three Toa Hodika managed to catch hold of ledges on the chasm wall and scramble up the other side. Nuju looked around and noticed that one member of their party was absent. Where's Norik? Up here! The voice came from above. They looked up to see that the Rahaga was ensnared in a part of the bridge's webbing. This is not entirely pleasant. Yeah, said Wenua. Been there, done that. Nokama glanced back over the bridge. Onowa and Mata were now effectively stranded. Worse, she could see the vague forms of Onorak approaching them through the mist. In a matter of moments, her two friends would either be captured by the Vizorak or forced off the edge and sent plunging into the canal to their doom. And the terrible thing is, I'm not sure which fate would be worse, she said to herself. Vakama stood in what had once been Turaga Duma's inner chamber in the Colosseum, later converted by Makuta for his own dark purposes. The centerpiece of the room was a dark, twisted throne. Even empty, there was no mistaking the fact that this was a seat of power. Go ahead, Rudaka beckoned. Touch it. Vakama reached out and let his fingers brush the throne. In that instant, his mind was flooded with shadows, images of evil deeds past and those to come, and a vast, all-consuming contempt for any who stood in opposition to his desires. No, not my desires. Makuta's, he realized. But in this moment, they are the same. We are the same. The eclipse. The earthquake. Makuta caused them by sending the great spirit Mata Nui into unending slumber. The Matoran and the Rahi and everything else that lives would be sealed away until such time as they could be awakened to live under our under his rule. That is why the Vizorak are here. That is why they have marched through and conquered land after land, and there is nothing on Metronui that can stop us. Them. Us. The Toa Hordika of Fire yanked his hand away from the throne, as if the chair had bitten him. It felt as if he had been touching it and awash in his corruption for an age, when in reality only a split second had passed. What did you see? asked Rudaka. Before Vakama could answer, Sidorak entered the chamber. 
You can look, Vakama, but don't touch. Vakama turned to see the king of the Vizorak approaching, flanked by two Onorak. Sidorak sat down heavily on the throne. I wanted to thank you personally, he said to Vakama. Because of you, the Rahaga will meet a fitting end. Just as soon as I think of one. It is just the beginning of what he can offer you, Rudaka said softly. Is that so? It is, my king, the viceroy purred. Vakama is my gift to you. A fitting master for your horde. Sidorak shook his head. As much as he respected Rudaka's wisdom, she was wrong in this case. The horde was far too large for any one field commander to manage. Rudika or not, there is only one of him. But Rudaka was prepared for this objection. Which is why the other Toa are on their way here. With Vakama leading your horde, they will be captured and trained, just like him. Will all six be enough to please you? A fine offer, Rudaka, Sidorak said. Consider it an engagement gift, Rudaka pronounced, smiling. Well then, Sidorak replied, glancing at Vakama. We should introduce you to the Horde. Matau looped another strand of webbing around two rock outcroppings. Satisfied with what he had created, he looked at Onewa. Come on. You're not thinking what I think you're thinking, said the Tohodiko of stone. Matau pulled the webbing taut and tested its strength. Then he stepped into the center of the makeshift slingshot and backed up against the resistance of the webbing, stretching it out. Yes, you are, said Onewa, stepping over to join the Tohodiko of air in the center. I knew there was a reason I always liked you. Working together, they forced the webbing back, back, until it was strained to the limit. Tight hold, said Matau. Onewa grabbed onto his fellow Toa. Then they both lifted their feet from the ground, and the slingshot snapped forward, launching them out over the chasm just as the Onurak burst into view behind them. Spotting Norik entangled below, Onewa reached down and grabbed him. Going our way? We did it, shouted Matau. We're going to make it. But the Tohodiko of air had spoken too soon. With the added weight of Norik, their momentum was spending itself too soon. They began to arc down toward the water below. Or not, added Matau. The Tohodika and Rahaga slammed into the water. Above, the three allies watched with concern. What do we do now? asked Wenua. Seeing as Norik is the one that knows the way to Kitongu, said Nokama, we swim. She ran and jumped off the ledge, executing a graceful dive into the canal. A moment later, she disappeared beneath the surface of the liquid protodermis. Wenua looked at Nuju. Oh, brother. The two Toa stepped to the edge, steeled themselves, and jumped off. Sidorak marched boldly through a Colosseum tunnel, Vakama dutifully following behind. The king of the Vezorak reflected on what he had accomplished this day. An engagement with Rudaka would have many positive effects. As queen of the hordes, she would share equally with Sidorak in the rewards of conquest, making it less likely she would try to undercut his power in the future. This ridiculous competition to earn Makuta's favor would end. Best of all, Sidorak would now have standing in Rudaka's land. And given the power of those set to dwell there, that was no small achievement. Vakama was another matter, of course. Sidorak saw no reason not to trust the Tohodika's defection, and it was true that no other horde master would be better suited to anticipate the strategies of Toa. Still, the king was determined that Vakama's ambitions would start and end with being field commander, and not extend to the throne. Sidorak knew from experience how quickly a ruthless being could ascend to power. You know, Vakama, you remind me a bit of myself at your age, he said. When Vakama made no reply, he added, That was a compliment. Thank you, my king, 
Vakama said half-heartedly. I think nothing of it. Such is the generosity of my rule, the king continued. My horde is an obedient one. They will do anything you command. Unless I command differently, of course. Of course, Vakama replied. Sidorak slapped the Tohodiko on the back, almost knocking him off his feet. Good. Now then. They stepped out onto the Colosseum observation deck. Assembled below were hundreds of Vizorak of every type, waiting for their orders. Meet the troops, boomed Sidorak. The eyes of the Vizorak spiders went from Sidorak to Vakama. Then, as one, they bowed before their new commander. Despite himself, Vakama felt a flush of pride. These were experienced hunters, crack teams that had ravaged a thousand lands, and yet they were prepared to follow his leadership. Where five Toa had scoffed at him, a thousand Vizorak were now ready to fight at his command. Perhaps you'd like to say a few words, suggested Sidorak. Vakama's Hodika side rose in full fury. He gave a roar that shook the Colosseum. The Vizorak horde rose to its collective feet and responded with a roar of its own. From a distance, Rudaka watched the scene unfold with pleasure. As Viceroy, she had limited authority over the horde, and many of the Vizorak refused to do anything without Sidorak's sated approval. But now Vakama ruled the horde, and she would rule Vakama. Sidorak doesn't know it, she thought, but he just became expendable. The Tohodika flew through an underwater chute at a frightening rate of speed. Unlike the above-ground chutes, this one was still functional, evidently from some power source previously undiscovered by the Matoran. That explains how the Vizera got to Metrinui, thought Nokama as she rocketed along. There must be other chutes under the sea that are still operating, though I can't imagine how. Her eyes more accustomed to seeing underwater than those of the others, detected something strange ahead. The chute curved upward abruptly and seemed to be ruptured in places. She could feel a chill in the water as she drew closer to that spot. The next instant, she was no longer in liquid protodermis, but skidding along a sheet of ice inside the chute. Water she could handle. Ice was another matter. Unable to check her flight, she went hurtling out of the chute, followed closely by Nuju and Wanua. All three sailed through the air before slamming into a snowbank. Shaken, Nokama looked around. They were in a white world, so bright it was almost blinding. It looked like Kometru, but a Kometru where the weather had gone mad. Where are we? she asked. Home, said Nuju. Wanua shook the snow of himself. Good, then you know where we are? Nuju looked around. With surprise in his voice, he answered, No. Wenua shook his head. Always watching the stars, but the Earth has its secrets too. Norik's hat suddenly popped out of the canopy of snow above them. Kitongu has never been found, my friends. It follows that where he lives hasn't been either. I don't believe it. It was Matau's voice coming from somewhere off to the left. Nokama turned to see the Tohodika of air pulling himself out of a snowdrift and pointing into the distance. It does sky touch, he said in awe. Norik and the Tohodika looked in the direction he was pointing. Liquid potodermis from the ruptured chute had jetted into the air at some point, only to be frozen solid, forming a mountain of crystal clear ice. Come! shouted Norik, already racing toward its base. On the floor of the Colosseum, the Vizorak Horde drilled in preparation for another battle. High above, Vakama watched over his legions, noting every aspect of their movement style and tactics. Is it everything I promised you? He glanced behind him to see Rudaka approaching, then turned his attention back to the Vizorak. We'll soon find out, he answered. Yes, a night of great consequence falls. Be ready. Before it is over, many things will change. She gestured toward the approaching Sidorak. 
Here comes one of those things now. The king of the Vizorak joined his viceroy and new general. How is my horde, Vakama? Obedient, answered the Tohodika. And ready, Sidorak, for anything that comes. Including Toa? Especially Toa, said Vakama. Sidorak surveyed the scene. As king, he felt he should be issuing some order or offering counsel, but Vakama seemed to have everything well under control. Well then, what now? The hardest part, answered Vakama, gazing out over the city. We wait. End of chapter 7